All right, let's talk about prompts and Lima, least intrusive, minimally aversive, uh, kind of the first dog training philosophy we're going to get into here. But I want to present it kind of in the context that it uh, that it, it lives in. So we're getting into how do we get behavior that we want? We're diving right into this. We've talked a little bit about kind of the foundational operant conditioning, classical conditioning. We're going to be referencing that a little bit. So if you haven't seen that, please go back and watch that introductory lecture. Now we're going to talk about prompts, kind of the next stage of, of training here. So the humane hierarchy is established by the CCPDT. I'll link to them in the description. That's who I'm certified through. That's who I've got these two certificates from. Been certified through them since like 2012 or something like that. Uh, the CCPDT is defined the humane hierarchy. I have to adhere to this as a certificate. What does this mean? This means that I have to start up here. These physical factors, environmental factors, and antecedents. When I start training, when I take on a training case, when I take on a behavior case, I have to start by addressing any physical factors that might be present. So let's say the dog is growling at people when we touch their paw. Okay, have we ruled out that there could be some pain? Has the dog seen the vet to make sure that that growling isn't the dog saying, hey, my foot hurts, please stop touching my foot. So we've got to look at physical factors. We've got to look at environmental factors. So the dog that is growling when I touch their feet, uh, could it be that there's something new in the environment that's irritating the paw pads and that might be the cause of it? Could it be that the dog needs kind of just a safer spot to hang out or a different way to communicate that they don't want their feet touched? Or um, actually to, to address that as an actual environmental factor, uh, is there a need for me to be touching the dog's feet or can I leave the dog's feet alone most of the time? Is it just that I need their feet touched during the context of nail trims? Well, in that case, let's be a little bit more specific about how we set that up. So once I've addressed that there's no physical factors that I need to address, and there's no environmental factors that I can change, and there's no antecedents, we'll talk about antecedents more when we talk about applied behavior analysis. Once I've identified that there's nothing there that I can change, then I move to positive reinforcement and classical conditioning. Now remember, positive reinforcement is defining what's happening after the behavior, right? It's defining the consequence of the behavior. So the first thing I need to try is seeing if there's a different behavior that I can reinforce, a different behavior that I can increase in frequency to get me the result that I want. Or can I change the dog's mind, change the dog how they change how the dog feels about the situation through classical conditioning? If neither of those two things is possible, then I can move on to negative punishment and negative reinforcement when needed. And finally, if I need to, I can move to positive punishment if needed. Now, the humane hierarchy is set up here specifically to prevent me from going straight to something like positive punishment. We'll get into why that is a little bit later. When we start talking about applied behavior analysis, we'll start talking about the exact reason why. But for now, know the humane hierarchy, know how we move through this, this process when we're modifying behavior. And we'll reference a little bit more as to why a little bit later as we get deeper into this. Now, Lima and... Um, Sort of the humane hierarchy is starting to talk about how we prompt behavior. When I say sit, the first time I say sit, my dog has no idea what I mean. First time I say sit, down, stay, come, let's go, whatever it is, my dog has no idea what that means, right? My dog doesn't speak English yet. So I have to teach my dog what I mean. The prompt is part of that teaching process. It's something that suggests what the behavior is. When I say sit and I lure the treat up above the dog's head, we'll talk about luring in a second here. I talk about when I lure the treat above the dog's head so that the dog sits, that lure is a prompt. The goal is to get rid of that prompt or to fade that prompt. So the cue is different from the prompt. And I want to be really clear about this because as we have discussions in the classroom um, about how do we get this behavior, how do we get rid of this behavior, we're going to need to define what's the cue and what's the prompt, what's the desired cue and then how do I get there? And are there any potential conflicts between that cue and that prompt? So the prompt is something that suggests a behavior and we're gonna fade that eventually. Remember it's different from a cue. The types of prompts that we use are ranked by intrusiveness. Now, in the dog training community, I've heard some debates about what's more intrusive than least intrusive and whether or not we've defined it. The human psychology world has already defined this for us. There's no need for us to redo it. The least intrusive prompts are verbal prompts. Sit, down, stay, come, etc. Now, 
those look like cues because generally they are, but sometimes I can train a complex behavior like go get me a drink from the fridge by putting together a string of verbal prompts. Go get me a drink, go to the fridge, tug, get it, nudge, bring it, drop it. The cue was go get me a drink and the prompts that I used were verbal prompts along the way to create that complex behavior. Now that requires the dog to know what each of those words mean and it requires me to train each of those ones individually and then put them all together in that string, which there's a couple ways to do that. There's not just one way to do that. You can also back chain that, but we'll talk about that later. So a verbal prompt is the least intrusive prompt. Gestural is the next, so gesturing towards something, gesturing that direction, go up, down, whatever it is. It's a little bit more intrusive, um, probably because I, I need the dog to be looking at me. I need the attention to be on me. Again, I'm pulling a little bit from human psychology here, and so my, my analogies aren't going to be exactly perfect across the board here because quick reminder, I am not, I do not have a degree in uh, psychology. If there's a psychologist that wants to talk about this with me, especially a, an ABA psychologist, I'd love to have that discussion. Hoping to bring in a couple of friends that do have their uh, certificates, or their diplomas to be able to talk about this a little bit more, uh, maybe a little bit better than I can, hopefully a little bit better than I can. Visual prompts, we use visual prompts in dog training a lot. Visual prompts are things like luring, targeting, um, I've got the treat or I've got something that is kind of encouraging the dog along there. That's that lure, think like a fishing lure. And then a target would be like I'm pointing to kind of the end result. So I want the dog to put their front feet up on a uh, up on a bench or something. I can lure that by putting the treat right on the dog's nose and then bringing the dog up until they put their front feet up. Targeting would be moving a step beyond that and just holding the treat kind of up where I want the dog's nose to end up. I'm targeting where I want you to end up, not bringing you along for the ride. Now, modeling is defined as more intrusive than that. This is social learning. This is a fairly new uh, field. There's not a lot of trainers that are doing this, but there are, I, I take that back, there's probably plenty of trainers that are doing this uh, in their own ways. One of the best that I've seen is Claudia Fugaza's Do As I Do protocol. I will link that down in the video description. She's got lots of great webinars, great presentations about this. Uh, and there's plenty of trainers out there that are doing this social learning. So me demonstrating a behavior and having the dog copy me, which is something that, that a lot of research said that dogs can't do for a while. Now we're finding that they're not only able to do it, they're able to do it extremely well. Uh, and they're able to remember what I did a couple minutes ago, which is really interesting. So modeling a social learning that is a more intrusive prompt than visual as defined by uh, human psychology. Now, physical is the most intrusive prompt. So physically pushing the dog, like physically pushing the dog's butt down, or um, physically grabbing the dog's paws to teach them to shake, or the paw to teach them to shake, a leash or collar correction, all of those kind of things are the most intrusive prompt that I can use. So let's talk about LIMA. LIMA stands for Least Intrusive, Minimally Aversive. A lot of organizations talk about LIMA, Least Intrusive, Minimally Aversive. Now we talked about aversives in the last lecture. We talked about uh, punishment right, being aversive to some degree. I want to, it has to be to some degree. I want to uh, use the least aversive, least intrusive, minimally aversive, the most minimally aversive, the smallest aversive, the least aversive thing I can use to get the result that I want. And I also want to use the least intrusive. So, how do we define least intrusive? Well, human psychology has already done it for us. We don't need to redo it. We don't have to come up with a new definition for dog training. It's already been established. We'll talk about applied behavior analysis a little bit more later, but if you'd like to look up some resources in the meantime, or if you'd like to look up something to substantiate what I'm saying or to uh, contradict what I'm saying, please let me know. But there's some debate over going least to most in training or most to least when we're acquiring new skills. And there's a lot of resources. I'm going to link to some of them. There are some resources available, uh, specifically resources for working with children with autism. We talk about prompting. We talk about least intrusive, uh, most intrusive, least to most or most to least prompting in order to get me what I want, get the behavior that I need. Now in dog training. We want to use the least intrusive prompt that is available to us right now. 
least intrusive prompt that is available to us right now. Now that requires me to evaluate where this dog is at right now. So looking over here at this graph, we're going least to most. So a time delay, I say something, sit, wait until the dog does it, and then reward them for doing it. It's a time delay prompt. That's gonna be the least intrusive prompt. Verbal, again, going back to verbal, Gestural modeling, partial physical, and full physical. Partial physical would be like a tap on the butt to, to encourage a sit. Full physical would be like physically grabbing the dog's butt and pushing pushing down. And I'm also pulling up on the chest. So that is the most intrusive prompt I can use. The debate we get into in dog training or the debate that a lot of dog training has is whether or not it's effective or not. Well, you shouldn't do that because it's not, it's not going to work. The reality is that it will work. The reality is that there are a lot of ways to train a behavior and they all will work. The problem and what we want to discuss and what we want to make sure that we're mindful of is what else are we learning? And is there a, le a less intrusive way of teaching that? Because long-term, I'd like to fade that prompt. And fading that prompt, I can go least to most or most to least here. When I'm fading, I can go full physical, and then go to partial physical, model, gesture, might skip modeling for dogs, dog purposes, we can skip some of these steps. So I might skip the modeling, I might uh, gesture down and then use that down cue eventually. Um, but I wanna fade it, I can go most to least like that or I can go least to most. So I try to say sit, the dog doesn't sit. I make the gesture, the dog still doesn't sit. I tap on the dog's butt. Uh, where I, I use a lure and then I tap on the dog's butt and then I physically put the dog in that position. That would be going least to most. Generally speaking, in dog training, we do, this is where it's going to get a little bit confusing here, so stick with me. We do go most to least. We want to use the least intrusive prompt we have available at that moment. But generally, when we're training, we do go from most intrusive to least intrusive. Now that might mean that I start at a gesture and then go to verbal, or I start at a physical, I start with a, a treat lure or I start with a treat target and then move to verbal. We tend to go that direction. So we tend to go the opposite direction of this visual here. Why, um, a lot of reasons why we do that. Um, there is a study that I'm gonna link to in the description here. The study did suggest that at least in human learners that most to least is more effective but remember, there's always a lot of variables to consider here. In any case, the goal of training is to get rid or to move away from that physical prompt whenever possible. Right? I want to be able to say sit. I don't want to always have to touch my dog's butt to make them sit. I don't want to always have to use that full physical or that partial physical prompt. And I also don't always want to use the gestural prompt depending on my context, right? We talk about this with assistance dogs a lot. With assistance dogs, I need a full verbal cue for that behavior. I cannot have anything on a gestural cue because I need that dog to respond to a person whose hands are full or who can't make those gestures with their hands. That's why they've got the assistance dog in the first place. So we talk about this a lot with assistance dogs, but we need to be talking about a lot with our personal dogs as well. Defining what is the cue, what is actually, what do I want to cue this behavior? And what are the things that I'm using as prompts to help this behavior along? And during my training process, am I using the least intrusive method available? Am I starting with that tap on the butt or that treat lure or that just pointing my finger up? There's plenty of dogs I, um, come from sheltering. Meet a dog for the first time I say sit, the dog doesn't know how to sit. We're evaluating at that point. We're not learning it. Uh, I move until I get to, if I just go like this, the dog sits. That's my starting point. Sit, treat, sit, treat, sit, treat, sit, treat, sit, treat. I've gone from most, right? I evaluated to see where I was at. And then I went from most to least. Big gesture, the little gesture to no gesture, to just a verbal. This benefits from a lot of discussion. Please discuss this with other trainers who know what you're talking about. Uh, please discuss this with uh, psychologists that know a lot more than me, psychiatrists that know a lot more than me. 
please discuss this with anybody that is qualified to have the discussion. Or you can join our coffee uh, classroom discussion. Um, you can sign up, the link's in the description of this video. You can sign up and we'll talk about it as a class in relation to dog training specifically. Okay, so the goal with dog training, the goal generally speaking with dog training is to use the least intrusive prompt that is available. That is least intrusive, minimally aversive. The butt tap is probably gonna be more aversive than using a treat to go up above the dog's head. So I'm going to use that treat going up above the dog's head. That is the minimally aversive method I can use. All right, I've said fading a bunch of times just to throw out there the definition of fading. Fading is gradually eliminating a prompt. We also use fading in a different way. Uh, we also use it in a slightly different way sometimes, but for now. This is the process of gradually eliminating that prompt. You can also use it to fade reinforcement or punishment. So I'm varying my reinforcement schedule or type to uh, fade that reinforcer. Again, I can go most to least or least to most. Generally speaking, we go most to least when we're learning a new skill. But we want to use the least intrusive prompt available. Luring, I've referenced luring a couple times. We use luring a lot. Lure, you might hear lure reward training. That is luring the dog into position and then rewarding them once they're in the position. This is a visual, sometimes a physical prompt. I might, um, I might like have, let's see, if I've got like a target on the ground or something and I want the dog to uh, step up onto it, I might need to like kind of lure the dog into it and then maybe I kind of like tap, kind of tap into position, like tap to encourage the dog to keep moving. I want to use a gentle taps as possible if that is least aversive to the dog. Um, nine times out of 10 though, we're just talking about putting the treat on the dog's nose and luring them into position. You can lure the dog up into a sit, down into a down. Um, I can lure a dog in a circle for like a spin or a turn. I can lure the dog onto their bed for a place, right? I can also use a toy for the same thing. I can also use anything that's reinforcing. I can use myself. I'm like walking away from the dog. I'm like, hey, come on, follow me. I'm right there with that dog. That what I'm using is myself, my attention, the lure. This is often the first step. I want to move away from luring because I'm trying to fade this prompt and because it can be distracting from the behavior itself. I might use this a couple times with a consistent rate of reinforcement. Right, we talked about that last time. I might use this with a consistent rate of reinforcement. And then as I move to a target, I might fade that into... Um, I might start fading that reward by going to a more intermittent schedule of reinforcement. Targeting is a visual prompt. Uh, it can potentially be a little bit gestural. Um, I'm pointing towards or I'm touching a physical, or I'm telling the dog to orient towards or touch some sort of physical target. So I can use anything for this. I could use this pen and to use the dog to touch their nose to the tip of this pen and then use that pen to kind of tell them where to be. So I could teach them to touch, the tip, touch their nose to the tip of this pen. And then I can put the pen up on a table and the dog will jump up on the table to touch the pen. I can use this on my hand. It's nine times out of 10 what we're using is our hand here. Target, some people's definition of a target is that there is some sort of treat in my hand when I'm targeting versus no treat in my hand would be more of like a, more of like a gestural prompt. I'm saying, hey, get up here, but there's nothing in my hand, just get up here. So most often we're talking about talking, we're asking the dog to target their nose towards something or their paws towards something. We also have target sticks. I don't have my target stick on hand, but you can use literally anything. You could use a drumstick with a um, ping pong ball glued to the end of it. That's what I do for chicken training. I glue a, a, a orange ping pong ball to the tip of a wooden dowel. I use that as my target stick for chickens. I do the same thing with dogs. Can also use tape. We do this with assistance dogs quite often. We use a little bit of blue tape. We teach the dog to nudge their nose against the blue tape on my hand. And then I can put the blue tape on my leg. I can put the blue tape on a drawer. I can put the blue tape on anything I need the dog to, like a crosswalk button. I can teach the dog to go nudge that by putting that blue tape on it. And then eventually I fade that target. So we want to go least to most. Um, I want to use the least intrusive prompt available. 
But when I'm teaching a new skill, I'm going to teach it most to least. So I'm going to say sit. See if the dog responds. No, can't use a time delay prompt. All right. Sit. No, didn't work. Gesture. Sit. Sorry. Sit. Gesture. See, I've been, um, I've been doing this for 10 years and I still have to be reminded once in a while. Sit. Gesture. Dog doesn't do it. Uh, maybe I do it with another dog present. Sit. This dog sits. This dog looks over and is like, maybe I'll do that. Uh, and then if that doesn't work, I go to my luring and my targeting, which are partial physical or that full physical prompt of physically pushing the dog into position. I'd like to avoid, it's probably a little bit uncomfortable for the dog. Okay. I mentioned prompts. Now I'm going to talk about cues. We're going to talk about cues a little bit more next time. This is a nice short lecture. The cue is the stimulus that makes the behavior happen every time. The thing that makes this behavior happen every time is what I want to keep. So as you, um, between whenever you're watching this and whenever you watch the next one, between that time, I want you to be looking at what are some of those potential cues that we want to use and what are some of those cues that we accidentally use? My dog knows plenty of them that he's accidentally learned over time. Anytime that I uh, walk into the kitchen and open up the treat bucket or the, um, the chewy bucket jar, whatever, if I click that open, that's a cue that he's going to get one of those, right? I can get rid of that if I wanted to. I don't really care to get rid of it, so I'm keeping it. But when I click that open, that's a cue for my dog to come into the kitchen and take that, that chewy from me. So what are those accidental cues? This happens in dog training really, really often where people will come to you and they'll say, my dog will only sit when I hold my hand over their head. Or whenever I clip the leash on, my dog starts barking. These things have all become cues for other behaviors that we don't necessarily want. Start looking for those in between this session and whatever you watch the next lecture. I'll see you next time.